Welcome to IGDC, everybody. Uh, so, guys, today this is the last in the panel session on the art track IGDC, and uh, you know we wanted to close the art track with a very very special session with a very special person. So today we have with us Tatu P Tatu Peterson Jason. Uh, Tatu is a senior art director at Rovio Entertainment, and uh, you know, big names. Uh, with 25, more than 25 years of experience and more than uh, you know 40 titles uh, being shipped, I would say is basically an art god. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, today, Tatu presents a talk on uh, how to tell stories through details in arts and visual de design, and uh, how to primarily insert soul into game art and make game feel like there's more to it than just a shell. Uh, during the session, Tatu will also give the attendees his perspective on uh, how to tell stories on visited platforms like mobile phones and uh, further explore this topic uh, through the learning, learnings from the, uh, uh, the Angry Bird movie production as well as examples from Angry Bird, uh, Evolution, Angry Bird, Journey and Small Town Murder. Uh, before I hand over the stage to Tatu, uh, just two little points uh, for the audience. One, uh, guys, please keep posting your queries in the Q&A tab. Uh, we will have a dedicated 10 to 15 minutes window towards the end of the session to respond to your questions. Uh, also, we will be pasting the links for the feedback form in the handouts tab as well as in the uh, discussion tab. Uh, towards the end of the session, please do spare some time uh, to fill the feedback form for the session. Uh, that was it from my side. Uh, over to you, Tatu. And we'll thanks, Mayank. Thanks, Mayank, for great presentation, uh, great introduction. Um, let me just share my screen and uh, let's get started. So, not to give any spoilers, let's go into the beginning of the presentation and let's go. So. Welcome everybody. Um, like I said, uh, my name is Tatu. Welcome to my session on the art of visual storytelling. Um, in today's session, I will go through some of the learnings I've had from the past projects in Rovio. I will talk about telling stories without using words, telling stories through the environments, characters, and props. I will be revealing some of my secret tips on how to make a game feel like it's more live like it has more backstory than it does and i think maybe most importantly to get the audiences to believe in the world you have created before we go deeper to the world of storytelling i want to tell you a bit more about who i am and mm -hmm. I thought that for this presentation, the, the most suitable way of doing it is that I would do it in terms of telling you a few very different stories about who I am. All of them are equally true, but showing a totally different perspective to my persona. Let's get started from the who I am professionally. So I'm Tato. I lead art at Rovio's Puzzle Studio. I've worked in the industry for around 20 years, give and take. Uh, during my career in games, I've worked in different creative and leadership roles in more than 50 games. I've worked on PC, mobile, web, and consoles. While my skill set is heavily skewed to leading and managing, I still enjoy getting hands-on from time to time. I'm always eager to learn new things. Uh, and while I've been around for quite some time, I still feel like I'm only at the start of my journey. Then there's this. I, I didn't make this game, but this is also who I am. I'm a kid who grew up playing games like this. I don't know if any of you uh, recognizes uh, this console, but it was around when I was a kid. This game is called Advanced Dungeons and Dragons. I used to play it with my father on Mattel in television. Uh, 
for me it was always so intriguing how they could do so much with so little intellivision had 4k cartridges so 4k to store everything graphics were very rudimentary and most of the story was on the front cover of the cartridge one of the most interesting things about games of this um, this era is that there was so little well-established conventions that the games differed from each other in very interesting ways. One of the coolest innovations about this game was the heads-up display or HUD for arrow inventory. Or better yet, the lack of it. The the player, if the player wanted to know how many arrows they had, they would have to press a button and the on the controller, and the game would give an audio hint on how many arrows you had. The game would play a short tick and repeat it as many times as you have arrows. This also meant that you couldn't really count your arrows in hurry. You had to find a quiet place to do the count. And just recently, I took the console out again, and I'm now looking forward for forcing the next generation to play it with me. It remains to be seen how the Minecraft and Roblox generation will enjoy it. Will they enjoy it as much as I did 30 or so years ago? Yes, so... I'm also a family man. Uh, I'm a father of three. Regardless of what I do, that plays a big part of how I view the world. The kids have taught me more than my 20 years in games industry. And I wouldn't be the lead I am today if it wouldn't be for the life lessons from my family. Especially from my firstborn, who has some special needs. No matter how privileged we are, life doesn't always go the way we planned. We all face hardship and struggle. It's how we fight through those that builds our persona. Then, this is also me. When I don't make games, play games, or spend time with my family, I do this. I practice and I occasionally compete in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. It's a sport that has taught me the importance of practice. No matter how tough you are when you start your journey in BJJ, you will most likely suck at it. The only way of getting better is by being humble and spending as much time on the mats as you can. So those are the four phases of me. And the point being that reality is messy. It's never clear cut, one dimensional. It's always messy. When you're telling a story, you are the one choosing the perspective. You are the one choosing the emphasis you choose what to include and what to what to exclude. You can be telling a story of the same character, but tell it very, very differently. And I think it's a good news for the artists. So congrats it's mostly on you because in games you need to do a lot of this through the visuals and i think it's especially true for mobile because let's face it um, no matter what we think but no one will look at your fancy cinematics and uh, even fewer will read the walls of text. On mobile, it's even worse, as 
most of us have thousand other things fighting over our attention. We play games like this in very, very small snippets, short sessions, dealing with constant interruptions. We pick up a game and we put it down and pick it up, put it down. So how do you even design games for that kind of an experience? Well, don't panic. With everything in storytelling, it always starts from the same place. You have to first figure out what is the story you want to tell. Again, what are the things that you want to emphasize and include? What are the things that you want to throw out the window altogether uh, that are so irrelevant for the story that they would be just confusing the, the, the user? What are the details that you can leave out? What are the things that you can that can be there but don't need to play a big role? And once you have your story straight, great. Then you can move on. Um, and then you need to start telling that story through all the environments, characters, and animations and props. Because like I said, no one will look at your cinematics and even fewer will read your walls of text. So in order to do this, you need to chop your story down to small visual clues that help you and your player to piece together the story you want to tell. In practice, this means that you have to ask yourself a lot of questions while creating the assets. Ask who, how, why. If you're working with a team, you need to ask them those questions. When you end up with a, uh, with a design, ask why that's the best design possible. Ask how would the character in this world construct this? How would that show in the end result? And you need to ask those questions again and again. You need to be relentless. Um, I truly learned this lesson when Angry Birds movie was being made. We worked closely with the movie team and took notes on how to build games that would feature the same characters and be based on the same settings. For me, it was... It was truly surprising that one of the questions that the movie team was asking was this. Can we put more feathers there? If you take a look at any single environmental assets from the Angry Birds movie universe, you'll be likely able to tell whether it belongs to the bird or pig island, and that those definitely belong to the same universe. With every rock, foliage, tree in the bird island, you could see the feathers being repeated. The bark on trees repeated the shape of feathers, the palm trees, the, the, the shape of the uh, repeat the shape of the feathers of um, tail feathers of Chuck, and every rock, mountain. Uh, and mountainside was engraved, embedded, and imprinted with feathers. Um, so does it make a difference? Well, on a single object level, probably not. In the big picture, it helps creating the connection with the characters and their world. It creates uniqueness to the world. And it makes the universe less generic. because. Even, even if um, the environments and some of the assets wouldn't be playing the main role, you want them to be unique enough that if you take them away from their context and you're just looking at the individual asset, the individual asset would be still telling you what IP it belongs to. 
So for the bird island, it was all about feathers. The environments were all about repeating the shape language and the, the images of feathers. Um, but then when we moved to the big island, it's all about snouts. So the question for the big island was naturally a bit different. The, the symbol of the peaks is their snout. And here, uh, one interesting differentiation is that the peaks, uh, that with the peaks, it's not the nature that reflects them. It's the world that they have built. In every object that they have made, they have put their mark on it. From the scepter of King Leonard, the microphone he's holding, to the pans and buckets, everything has a snout on it. And while the feathers and snouts form the basic layer of the world, each individual place in the world needs to also be taught from the perspective of who's living in this particular place. With every room, every set, it's the same set of questions. Who lives here and how the world should reflect them? As an example, the mighty eagle in the Angry Birds universe is a bit of a fragile persona. He's a myth. He's a legend. He clothes in his fame. He's making sure everyone knows how great he is. But the reality is not always in line with the stories he tells. He has a huge trophy shelf full of trophies, but if you take a closer look at the trophies, most of them are participation trophies and store models. There's the story that the Mighty Eagle, as a character, wants to tell. And then there's the story that the environments are telling on his behalf. And the whole pun of it is the contrast between the two. Sometimes the environments can also be telling about the story that isn't even being told to the player in any direct way. In Angry Birds Evolution, for example, we had these dungeons and pyramids and we needed the place to feel ancient. While it wasn't, wasn't necessarily important for the main story, we wanted to create a coherent story for these parts of the world. So we created a backstory about the cult of Chuck. Instead of the world repeating just the birds and pigs um, and things relating to them, the dungeons were filled with hints that the, 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 that the long-gone society that built those was worshipping Chuck. Similarly, in one of our newer games, Angry Birds Journey, we kept this in mind when planning on the environments. While in Angry Birds Journey, the birds travel through new places never seen before in Angry Birds universe. Many of these locations hint that it's not the first time the birds and pigs are visiting those places. The structures and the ruins left behind by the lost societies have some very familiar faces. With a good backstory, it's easier to keep the game expanding in expected way and still stay consistent. Then every game and every IP should also have its secret sauce. It can be many things. When working on mobile free-to-play games, it's often that I start from the strategic dimension. I try to think in advance how to support the expansion needs for years to come. Sometimes it's the environments that need room for expanding. Sometimes it's the characters. With many, many of the Angry Birds games, um, the, the strategy has been this. It's been built on our love for pop culture. With Angry Birds Evolution, again, uh, for example, we, we made a strategic decision to make the pop culture connection an integral part of the character's DNA. Take Don Bacon, 
here as an example. He's the main antagonist of the game. Don, Don, uh, Don, the head of Bacon Corp. He lives in a Bacon Tower, puts his name on everything he does. He's really a combination of many tropes, but for us, one obvious inspirational figure was a political figure that was back then running for presidency in the States. And for credible deniability, I won't disclose any names or details on this. And I can say that the joke stopped being funny really quick when the dude actually got elected and we had to burn our make bacon crate again hats. The thing with characters like these is that not everyone will get the references, but those who will, will feel clever for noticing. And those who don't can just, can just enjoy a character that seems to have a well-designed deeper backstory. Continuing with the presidential theme, here's one example of a special event bird that we made for Thanksgiving event way back when. Um, he was called, called Turkey. And the whole story behind this character was that there's, in US, there's this weird Thanksgiving tradition that every year the president ceremonially pard pardons a turkey. And then everybody celebrates it by eating turkey. So go figure. So this bird is a combination of a bad pun based on that tradition and some of our favorite prison break movies. It's usually not just one thing, but a combination of multiple things. And you can really see the similar underlying approach in many of these. Um, if I get this video to work, let's see. So many beautiful people looking for a miracle. Yeah. So many beautiful people. Woo. Angry Birds Evolution. Who's in your flock? And the um, same can be seen from these characters from Small Town Murders. The kind of pop culture connection is very strong in many of these. And it's been important for both of these games, like to have that strategic mode ability, to have expendability in the cast of these games. Because for both Angry Birds Evolution on the one hand and Small Town Murders on the other hand. For both of these, it was essential that we're able to bring content and bring more characters like week in, week out, every month, something fresh. But the, the kind of pop culture thing, it's not nothing new to us. Um, it can also be seen in many of our more classic games like Angry Birds Angry Birds Friends. This game in particular, it, it's been live for over 10 years and the team still finds ways of keeping the game fresh and the audience engaged with a great events like these. Many of them playing a homage to pop culture phenomenons that we adore. This strategic mode ability also enables collaborations like this one. Um, this one we did with one of our all-time favorite bands, the Iron Maiden. With the Iron Maiden, we did actually more than one event. And uh, I could show you the trailer for the first ever event we did with them in Angry Birds Evolution.
words in the region. Could you tap in, maybe? I'm loading. Oh. So, when creating environments, think of what makes the world unique and what makes it special. What kind of stories you need, need to tell and what kind of means you have in your disposal. Don't forget the technical needs either. And remember to ask yourself or your team with every asset, what are the symbols of this culture? Who built the objects and structures? Who lives here? What could be what could the environment tell about them and their ways? Think about things as how old or new the objects are. What are the expectations of the users and how you should take those into account? And pretty much the same thing with characters, really. So don't settle for stereotypes. Stereotypes can be handy sometimes, but most of the time they lead to very one-dimensional characters and you might end up unintentionally perpetuating negative stereotypes. So be especially careful with these when you're dealing with characters that are taking their inspiration from cultures that are not yours. Instead of stereotypes, try to make your characters feel more authentic by making them a combination of more than one thing. Player characters can be an exception to this sometimes. With the main characters, it's often better that those are the more vanilla ones. Empty canvases that the player can project more of their own qualities to. With all the characters, even if you haven't been provided with a backstory, try to come up with one. Who is this character? What kind of history he or she has? What about hobbies, habits, and abilities? How should it, re it relate to other similar characters? Other characters in your game and other characters in other games and other for uh, other works of fiction with every single aspect of the characters you can try to emphasize these attributes focus on few and use the other aspects as extra flavor for this slide i i didn't choose this image here just randomly it's a statue called boxer at rest from Rome's Museo Nazionale. Even without any props or clothing, you can see a lot of story being reflected from the face of the character. Um, you might notice the cauliflower ears that show that the man has been doing this for a while, especially if you do some martial arts. You might see the cuts and wounds in his face, and you can tell from the beard and wrinkles that He's not a young man anymore. But you can also see from the pose the kind of inner calmness in the character. So you don't need all that much gimmicks. It's the details that count. So is that too much to ask? And frankly, sometimes it is. For those times, um, here's the juicy part. Here's my secret list of how to fake it. So this section, it's intentionally simplific intentional simplification of my, uh, my way of looking into the, this topic, and by no means this is a complete list. But I hope that these six very, very small, very, very simple tips will help some of you into making better and more authentic game worlds. So 
if you took notes from the previous two slides, great. With those tips, you can go very, very far. But let's look at the tips from my, my secret list of faking it. So first, symbols. Try to figure out few symbols that are essential for your world and try to repeat those in everything you do. You would be surprised how far you can get with just this one tip. Think about what are the snouts, what are the feathers of your game world. Sometimes when I'm, I'm making a game, this is the place where I start from. Like immediately when we have like some kind of a basic understanding about the story we're about to tell, I jump right into this. Because this will be also helping you with kind of the overall shape language. So for Angry Birds, it's, it's feathers, snouts, sometimes eggs. And those are then repeated in many of the things uh, in the games. Second tip, the wear and tear. In, in general, I think it's a good idea to add some signs of use to everything so that your world looks like it's been lived in. Um, this is the kind of triple A mentality but I think it's um, applicable to any kind of games. Um, when you're thinking about like very simple stuff, like um, what kind of a wear and tear do you end up having in different kind of surfaces? Um, let's take an ex as an example, like the ignition lock on a car. It's always... Like the surroundings are always full of scratches because like people never get the, the key into the ignition uh, hole on the first try. You always need to be kind of wiggling in the round and then you find it and then you turn it. So there's always signs of uh, use unless it's a brand new car. And that's one of the things that many games, in my experience, get so wrong that they present these ideal unused products. And when you have like a world full of environmental assets that are brand new, it, it feels weird. It doesn't feel authentic. So think about the wear and tear, the signs of use. Thirdly, try to insert some juxtapositions and contrasting things to add memorability. People pay disproportionate amount of attention to these things as they are unexpected and differ from their expectations. Then tip number four, groups. This makes the world easier to understand. People group things naturally. We categorize. Uh, we, we, we're obsessed with groupings and... Uh, groupings with everything think about just kind of like your music taste like for many it's important to know like what kind of buckets or how to how to box your musical taste same is for for characters it just makes it so much easier to understand when you group them and make them into groups you don't necessarily remember all the different characters, but you re remember the groupings. And the groupings will also make it easier for the players to remember the individual characters in those groups. Then tip number five, legendary locations. Or maybe just one. All great IPs in my experience seem to have these. If you think about Lord of the Rings, if you think about Harry Potter, if you think about Angry Birds. So from Mordor to Mount Eagle, Eagle Mountain, there's these 
legendary locations that are very central to that uh, universe and that IP. Then, as a last tip, try to tie everything together with some strategy. Think about it from uh, the long-term needs point of view. What are the long-term needs for your IP? What are the immutable aspects and where you'll need more flexibility? How will you support or make decisions that support and make your life easier on the long term? Do you want to base everything to, for example, pop culture? Or do you just want to use some other ways of enabling creativity within that universe? And remember that it's often just as time consuming to create an asset that feel, uh, that tells a story than a generic one that doesn't. The difference is mainly in the quality of your preparation and to some extent the amount of it. But more or less, it's the, the same time that is taken regardless. Thank you. I would actually say that one just, you know, this was enlightening. Can, can, can you hear Great me? to hear. Yeah, I can hear. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, I, I was actually, and I'm really thrilled to have been, you know, uh, got a chance to be a part of this session. This was really, really, you know, quite in-depth. I just loved it. And uh, from the, uh, you know, the discussion that has been happening uh, with the audience, I can definitely make out that the audience was also enjoying this session as much as I was. Yeah. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping people to get inspired by it. Um, yeah. I am sure people will be inspired by this. A lot of people are actually asking, you know, when this session will be you know, available online for us. So, yeah, people are definitely looking forward to going through the whole session again. And, uh, yeah, it was really great. Okay, uh, so we can move on to the question and answer answers now. Uh, let's move to the Q&A tab and we'll start picking up questions. We still have a bit of time left for that. All right, so the first question says, uh, when working with external IPs, something that Rovio has done quite a, quite a bit of, how mm. is the art direction chosen? Uh, is there a standard process or is it different for each party like Iron Maiden or Star Wars, etc.? I think with, with when working with kind of external IPs, um, every IP holder is different. Uh, and I, I, I have a little bit of experience from kind of both sides, like being there as the IP holder, working with externals and instructing them how to treat our IP, uh, but then being on the, the other side and kind of having those discussions with the IP holder, uh, there's never kind of a standard uh, because every IP holder is so different and every IP is different. So you can't treat Iron Maiden the same way as you're treating uh, the world uh, health organization. They have like total different kind of organizations that you're dealing with and totally different kind of rules and guidelines of how their IP should be treated. So you have to always kind of adapt to their ways of working. Yeah, that makes sense. All right, over to the next question. So the next question is, uh, how difficult is it to transition a game concept into uh, you know something which is across different mediums like the movie. Yeah, I think it's it's a very good question, um, and and it's also one of those things that even for um, for Angry Birds, I believe that it's at least partially being being at the right time at the right place and luck plays a big role in it. Uh, 
Um, and one of the, the difficulties that come from it is that each of the each of the mediums have their own special needs that they, they what works in movies doesn't necessarily work with uh, mobile screens. Um, the original IP was created very simplistically and many people fell in love with the kind of shape language of like the birds being just balls with uh, eyes and the simplicity and the readability and recognizability was probably the one of the key sources of affinity. Whereas when we wanted to tell stories on the big screen and make a blockbuster 3D animation, we needed a totally different kind of, we had totally different kind of needs from the storytelling point of view. Like having just the birds jump up and down as a ball shape without hands or legs, it would have been harder for us to tell the stories we wanted to tell. So I think that was kind of a very pivotal moment as well that we we just suddenly added limbs to our characters and totally redesigned them to work on a bigger screen. And that's something that I think like um, people should consider when, when kind of moving back and forth uh, or transitioning an IP from one medium to another is to think like, does it need to be adapted? Can we work with the same visual rules and guidelines on both of these mediums? Or do we want to evolve and refresh or re think the whole IP for this new medium that we're going for. That, that was an interesting thing. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So the next question says, uh, what according to you is the seed or the framework uh, for this visual language strategy? For example, uh, using pop culture or something familiar to, the, uh, to drive the visuals and putting a twist on it? Or mm -hmm. is it building back stories or personas? Uh, for each of the protagonists and environments. Is there a formula for this approach? Is that, no, is that a formula for this approach? Or do you have to do a list or something? Yeah, I, I think uh, in, like, in the games I've worked in, it's been kind of natural, not necessarily so rigid uh, process, but it, I, I feel that we've we've often been been just kind of going with the lot with the gut feeling of like hey now we need some kind of a character like this and then we go through uh, some of the pop culture things that come to our mind from that and then we think about like would that be fun would that be fun and we end up with um, those things that make us us laugh and and then we try to. And we're we're hoping that those that things that make us laugh will make the the audiences laugh as well. I'm I'm pretty sure that there's also some really big misses that that made us laugh a lot, but are totally mystery to our audiences. Especially in Angry Birds Evolution, where we kind of added thousands of characters into the the spin off universe of Angry Birds. Um, I can't hear you. Hey, my uncle, we can't hear. All right. I'm sorry. I think I'm back. Now. Yes, you're back. Now. Yeah, you're back. All right. I'm sorry. All right. So, uh, all right. So we'll move on to the next question then. Uh, when can we conclude that we have enough level of detail for a character? Uh, means that how to avoid spending too much time on thinking about yeah um that's why i also kind of like to gravitate towards having some kind of a system in place like uh, some kind of a template in place that okay it's going to be this this thing plus this thing and then this thing um i think for for game characters um there's also the kind of one thing to consider is that uh, you have to think about the, the functionality. 
uh, because form follows function and that's always the kind of start from for many games this is the important things uh, for the classic slingshot games like we have to first think about if the form is helping the player understand the uh, mechanics so it really depends on the character the, the type of game that you're working on so like if you're working on a game like Dota, for example, you have to really put a lot of energy in thinking about is that character readable? Is it recognizable? Is the the shape, the form, the animation, is it is it uh, uh, telling the players how it's going to be? Well, uh, what's the, what's the the kind of how how to use that character? And also, like, if you think about that kind of games, you have to design them from that perspective that you're watching them. You have to be looking them a lot from the kind of top-down uh, third-person view. You shouldn't be ever thinking about them from the, the kind of side view because players won't be seeing them from the side view all that much. Uh, but, yeah, I, I think, like, you notice when there's too much detail, when the readability and the understandability uh, gets cluttered. That's why for, for me, like the general rule is that I want to kind of focus on one thing so that there's one thing that it's, it's very clear that this is the main thing of this character. Um, if, it, if, it's, uh, if it's any game where there's any kind of like special ability, I want to probably tie it to that special ability. So that's at least clear. Um, if it's a warrior, it needs to probably have like a huge uh, um, weapon that tells that it's a warrior, and you have to kind of play with the tropes and the conventions of um, of uh, these characters, and and kind of treat the meet the expectations of the the users for this type of characters, and then everything else you put on top is kind of just adding adding the authenticity. But it should never go in the way of understandability. That the kind of form follows function is always more important. And the readability and understandability is more important. Right, exactly. Yeah, I think the, the you know uh, the it primarily depends upon the game design and uh, what's our requirement, like how we mm. want the whole thing to be translated to the audience. The experience, yeah, exactly. the overall package matters. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so the next question says, uh, there's a follow-up uh, focusing on Iron Maiden. Uh, given yeah. that the band has multiple different themes across albums, uh, what drove the choice towards primarily Power Slave? Please <laughs> judging from the video. <laughs> we, we did actually um, choose some of the, the kind of, um, for, 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 the, the, for the first... Um, First event, I think that was kind of the Power Slave character was the the main character in the trailers and the marketing things. But we also had um, uh, characters from other albums. So there was like uh, in total there was eight different uh, characters. With the second event, we were just like focusing on the legacy of the Beast because we wanted to also kind of with these events, it's always that we wanted to be kind of a win win. We want to uh, help our partners who are we, who we're working with to kind of spread the message that they want to be spreading. And at the time of the second event, um, they wanted to kind of uh, promote their tour of Legacy of the Beast tour. For the first one, we just wanted to kind of focus on the the most legendary, the most uh, most well known. Uh, things, but also the ones that We're sorry for the glitch, guys. <laughs> and uh, we will see how you know, we went backstage. Uh, all right, so we'll continue with the question and answers. Okay. All right, so there's one question asking for some tips. So guys, we're already running over time, so we won't be able to pick up all the questions. So I'll be just uh, hand-picking a few of them. Uh, 
Uh, do you have any tips on balancing video stories in visually dense genres like dance strategy? Can you repeat the question? Um, do you have any tips on balancing visual stories in visually dense genres like grand strategy? Uh, even I don't get this. What? What? Uh, so, uh, Mr. Ujjwal, can you please uh, elaborate on what you know refer to when you say grand strategy? Meanwhile, we'll pick up another question. Uh, can you add visual storytelling elements? Into ah, now I found that I found that question. So. Okay. Right. Do you have any tips on balancing visual stories in visual dense genres like grand strategy? Mm. I, I, yeah, I think that question probably would need a little bit of kind of uh, uh, elaboration. Um, I think for every gen genre, there there's the kind of their own ways of doing it. Um, the the one thing that um, I find to be the biggest differentiation between different genres of games is that uh, they have different ways or different means to tell stories. Like if it's a narrative game, you have a lot of uh, possibilities of se telling the stories through cinematics and those walls of text. And many people will be getting a lot of the big part of the story from those. But then if you're playing, like making a game like 4X strategy game, um, then you have totally different storytelling means. You have to be telling the story through the characters, the the maps, the what you see on the maps. And it's, it's so much more about the kind of environments and characters and the visual storytelling. And it, I think in some of those cases, it's... Uh, 90% of the story is told by the artists through their art. So it, treat that also as a kind of like, um, it's a big responsibility. All right, so we'll uh, just pick up our last question because we're already in time. Uh, so the question is, how to write engaging story and create our audience? I know it's a vast one, but would like to hear from you. Yeah, I, I think that's been kind of probably asked many times in the in the history of entertainment. But I, I think like one of the things is that, and this is kind of like just kind of trying to think about my own perspective to this, is that the best stories are always somewhat relatable. And this goes to also why many of the the uh, main characters in many forms of entertainment are kind of blank canvases, whereas your uh, characters, uh, supportive characters, might be much more interesting than the main character. The main character is often like so vanilla that no, there's nothing to dislike, and that's sometimes the kind of the most important thing about main characters is that there's very few. Um, a big, um, for, for very very few things about the the main characters that people in general dislike, because most of the time the main characters will end up being your representation in that game, and you're going to be putting a lot of your own uh, abilities, and you're reflecting yourself into that characters, and you're stepping into the shoes of that character, and stepping into the shoes of the main character becomes much more easier uh, when uh, when there is not a lot of storytelling in the way. So that's why you maybe need to put more of the kind of engaging thing and more interesting stuff on the the supportive casts. And one of the, the kind of main, like the most interesting character, the best character design in my, my experience is the main antagonist. The, the bad guys, the the whatever you're against in the world, those are those can be so interesting because like you don't have to care about whether people are loving those characters because most people need to hate them. They need to look annoying. They need to be annoying by their behavior and how they look like, and they they can be menacing. People don't necessarily because people don't need to uh, associate themselves with those characters. 
So with that kind of characters, you can just go crazy. And um, I guess that's kind of the basic formula for any storytelling that you have good side characters and good enemies and good uh, bad characters and you have uh, relatable uh, main characters that you can then relate to and experience the world through them. I just love that response. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatu. Uh, you know, the, the whole presentation was just great and especially all the, you know, your answers to all these questions are also very really interesting. Uh, so yeah. me, uh, you know, Thanks for having me. Thank you for doing all this effort uh, for uh, making our uh, you know, the conference. The, just you know, giving uh, putting in this effort and making it special through your talk. So before we sign off, guys, please don't forget to uh, fill up the feedback form. And uh, the last the last one, uh, you know, I would actually like to take this moment to thank all our sponsors once again. Our presenting sponsor is Daniel Engine. Gold sponsors are APL, AWS, Glance, and Jungly. Legacy Silver sponsors are GameShan, Luxury Digital, and Yes No. Bronze sponsors are Quadri and GameEon. That's all from our side for today, guys. Thank you very much. Good night. Hope you enjoyed this session. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.